In my recent documentary about DiviCam, I talked about the history of digital video and how it evolved from the analog formats to the non-linear editing. But how did we edit before DV? Today, I bring you the FPS 60, a video editing car by Fast Multimedia, released in the mid-90s and designed to work with computers as low as a 486. So, how was video editing when computers were far from actually being editing capable? The FPS 60 is the low-end car from a range of products from Fast Multimedia that targets the amateur videographer. This range of cars, along with the well-known video blasters, would provide capturing and enhanced playback capabilities allowing to export any edited material back to a PCR or TV. The specifications of this product, although far from other professional solutions existing at the moment, were quite attractive for those willing to get into non-linear editing at low cost. This type of cars used to work as a bridge between the graphics card and the monitor, and would do all video processing entirely by hardware, preventing the computer to do any heavy lifting. That's why they would work in such machines that were still unable to play a good quality video. The only requirement would be to have a hard drive capable to sustain the data transfer speed to read and save the video files. The car has two connectors, one where we would connect the monitor and the second where we would connect the included special adapter with all the video inputs and outputs. It offered two different video inputs switchable between S-Video and Composite, two video outputs and one audio output. For the audio input, it would relay on our sound car. The package also included some editing software, Media Studio in this case, and MPEG-1 encoding utility. Although the car didn't offer hardware MPEG encoding or decoding, unless a hardware extension was added. All the drivers would fit in one unique floppy plus an extra plug-in disk that would be required for Windows 95. So let's install this car in a computer and take a look at how it performs. To do so, I'm going to use the Pentium 100 that I fixed in the last episode. As you can see, I mounted it in this sort of custom frame. If you are interested in learning more about this, watch my last episode. I have to confess that I cheated a little bit with the video title, because I'm not going to use a 486, and the reason is that I don't have any in my collection right now to use in this video. However, this card does work in a 486, and according to the requirements, it only requires a 386SX with 4 MB of RAM, which I find quite impressive. But let's go ahead and install the FPS 60. The car is longer than usual, and some of the ISA slots are not suitable, so I will have to move the sound car to be able to install it. As you can see, it goes connected to the graphics card directly, acting as a middle agent between it and the monitor. To be able to install some of the software, I will also add a CD-ROM in my setup for now. So, once all is connected, I will turn on the computer and see if everything loads properly. Thus is initiating properly, which means no hardware issues and that the car bridge is working as expected. So let's go for the drivers. 
all the software will run under Windows environment. The first thing that I will notice is the requirement of having the video for Windows software installed, which I didn't. So that's what I will do next. After this, the main installation will run with no issues. All drivers are in one unique disk, which makes the installation quick and simple. Once completed, we can see a bunch of utilities for our car, being the most important, the setup and capture utility. The movie capture will automatically display whatever video signal is coming into our car, none in this case. As a video source, I will use my DVCam DSR11 VCR that I already used in previous projects. I'm also going to use this mini DIN to RCA adapter to use the composite video input. As soon as I click play, an image will appear in the box. However, it will require some setting adjustments, such as selecting composite video, and to make it fit on the right position. As you see, the overlay is not well adjusted. This configuration will depend on our screen resolution and only needs to be done once if we don't change it. When this is completed, we can see the image perfectly aligned inside the box. And I have to say that the quality of the video is quite good. It plays smoothly, and I can see any glitches despite it's not the full video resolution. Before capturing, I can also decide the quality of the capture with a maximum of 1200 kilobytes per second. And two video size options are available, allowing to capture only one or both fills. Selecting both fills will make the image actually bigger than my screen, and the files are noticeably bigger too, as that is supposed to be the full SD video resolution. But I can't appreciate a big difference in quality on the preview. Capturing is as simple as clicking the capture button. I see it usually drops one frame at the beginning, but the rest works fine. I can notice the hard drive working though. The captures will be stored in an ABI file with MJPEG encoding. When playing one of these files, the encoding will be detected and the card will decode it so it will play quickly and smoothly. However, I can see the quality is lower than the original due to the compression. A 1 minute video capture in one film mode took 28 megabytes of disk space. Next. I will capture a few more clips in more modes, one and two fills, to make a small editing later. It's annoying that I have to manually enter a file each time, or it will overwrite the previous one. I capture a few minutes only, and it's about 400 megabytes. This is a quite substantial amount of space for a mid-90s computer, as hard drives were not much bigger. Although I can use any editing software, including Premiere, I will give a try to the Media Studio that came in the package. A 
An easy installation will lead to this simple interface to do our basic editing. Unfortunately, the card does not enable real-time playback for the timeline, so the preview window will not be hardware accelerated, making the playback quite useless. We can, however, play each of the clips independently. When we finish our editing, we will need to export or render the whole timeline in order to be played through the video card and recorded externally. The unmodified clips will just be processed quickly without being recompressed, but any effect or transition will require some long render. It will be also important to select the correct video codec. And I honestly can't imagine this rendering on a 386. When the export is completed, we can just play the clip with the media player. When the car is playing a video file, it is at the same time emitting the video signal through the video outputs, so we can actually record that onto a VCR or display on a TV. But now let's take a look at the quality of the capture. This is a one fill capture. If we compare it with the original DV capture, there is a noticeable difference, especially in the clip resolution. In this enlarged image, we can see the encoding artifacts and lack of detail, but this is still a quite good quality video format compared with the videos we could find in many multimedia applications back then. The clips captured with the two fills option actually double the vertical resolution, but not the horizontal, so they play like this in a modern computer. Seems like a trick they use to save resources. After correcting this, I can see that the quality is a little bit better than the previous clip, and I would say that this is not much worse than a VHS tape. It still will have some loss compared with the original DB file, but it would be totally acceptable in an amateur home video studio of the 90s. These images were recorded with a professional camcorder. I guess that if using an amateur VHS or Video 8 camcorder, we wouldn't see that much difference. This specific clip it doesn't look actually bad, considering the hardware we used. I hope you enjoyed the exploration of this peculiar piece of hardware. The FPS 60 was my gate into the world of video editing. With it, I was able to edit my first home movies, but well, that's another story. So thanks for watching, and see you next time.